Good Friday morning. Welcome into the Illini Inquirer podcast. It's Jeremy Warner and Joey Wagner. Hello to all our live YouTube listeners and everybody listening on the podcast as well. We appreciate you. And Joey, I want to share with people, we were kind of planning on doing this yesterday, uh, but you gave me the good advice. Hey, let's wait until they announce somebody to hire. We thought yesterday could be the day. And you were correct. We were going to do it in the afternoon, but didn't get any news in the morning. But yesterday, we get two pieces of news. One that has become official. Justin Stepp is the new Illini wide receivers coach. We will dive into that hire. And our own Matt Zenitz of 24-7 Sports reporting that Archie McDaniel is the expected hire as linebackers coach. But we got a lot of football to catch up on. So before we get to East Lansing, we thought, why not uh, join with the people here live on YouTube and, and talk about a lot of Illini football news, especially on the staff side of things. Yeah, it's February and news is – it feels like it's picking up again, Jeremy, after like kind of a quiet three weeks. I don't even know how quiet it was. But, yeah, coaching staff season. And, like, I keep thinking, like, man, see it – like, we're covering turnover here, right? And it's it's February and there's still turnover. And then I, I see our guy Matt on 24-7 on Twitter and I'm like, oh, it's everyone. Like, this is rebuilding coaching staff season, you, whether it be – new staffs in college football or jumps to the NFL. I mean, it's that's what February kind of is now is you get through signing day, you kind of make those parting decisions or coaches leave or whatever, and, and now you rebuild your coaching staffs. And that's what Illinois has to do now for a second straight offseason. Yeah, this is two years of a lot of turnover, right? And and that can be scary. Uh, so I understand some angst out there. Now, Brett Bielma decided to make two of these moves, right? Like he decided – to fire two of his staffers. He said he's had seven in his time as, as a head coach. I have not gone back and fact-checked him on that. But he's I think had he may have years. meant like after one year. Okay, because Tony Peterson Cause, was one of them, right? Like, Yeah, because seven seemed, seemed like low for him to fire someone, like, given how long he's he's been in the field. So I thought I took that to mean like he's only fired someone after one year seven times. I could be wrong, but that's how I assumed it. Either way, he does not do this a lot. He fired a couple guys at Arkansas, but – um, I think he's showing urgency in changing that defensive staff. We'll get into that here. Uh, some initial impressions of David Gibbs, who we got to talk to. And boy, he's an interesting character. So we'll dive into that a little bit. Uh, but now they have one more on defensive side to hire with Charlie Bullen uh, going back to the NFL after just one season. And before we dive into that, Joey, like the reaction to some of these things that we hear from the fan base, and some of it can be. You don't want to react too much to the vocal people on Twitter, but I get some angst after a, a five and seven season that was disappointing to take a step back after an eight and five year that was a huge breakthrough. Um, what did you make of, of all the angst of you know losing George McDonald, then Charlie Bullen? Uh, I didn't know people had such big opinions on, on Charlie Bullen or whoever it was. I'm, I'm a big fan of Charlie Bullen, the person. I think he's a really skilled coach as well, but. Um, you know, I think I think it all stems from a disappointing season where your expectations rose and then you fall and people think, oh, we missed our opportunity. I think there's some some legitimacy to, to some of that angst, but it is an important offseason now that you have to replace two assistant coaches that you didn't plan on losing. Yeah, I think had they made a bowl game last year and then you see some of this turnover, maybe you'd have less angst. And, of course, look, it comes after the offseason that you lose Ryan Walters, Kevin Kane, Corey Patterson. That it? Those are three. Well, and Ben Miller got – Ben Miller, out. yeah. So, like, this is the second straight offseason of turnover. So I understand where people are coming from, and, and they want to see that sustained, sustained success. That's all we hear about, right? And with that, there, there's a continuity element that comes to that and in, in most cases – but then, yeah, you, you factor on they were five and seven, and the way that they lost some of those games that kept them out of a bowl game was gut wrenching in, in a lot of different elements. So I, I understand it. And then it's like the fear of the unknown and the transfer portal is awesome for fans. But yeah. when it comes to coaching staff, it, it's a little uneasy. Uh, but I don't, I think we also have to just kind of observe what this is. Like to this point, I wouldn't call it a mass exodus. George McDonald took a job at a college football playoff contender at a chance he's probably going to get more money and, and there's probably more upward mobility for him. Right. Charlie Bullen. I, I don't want to speak for Charlie because I, I we haven't talked to him. Yeah. He's a long, he's an NFL lifer, got to college for a year and went back to the NFL. I mean, you can connect the dots and feel like maybe college just what, like the, the timeline wasn't for him. And the other two were Brett Bielma decisions. So yeah. like, I, I don't see this as some like 
coaches are fleeing out of champagne. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's turnover and there's an angst that comes with that. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, really important that you keep the core of your staff, which to me is always your coordinators. And I know some people wanted them to move on from a defense corner. I didn't ever think that was really going to happen after one year of Aaron Henry, but some of these moves are to help Aaron Henry, right. Are, are to surround him with, you know, maybe better pieces, more complimentary pieces. We'll dive into that. Barry Lonnie going into a third year continuity on offense. I, it just hasn't happened that often with Illinois. Rod Smith and Bill Cuber are the only guys that I've covered that have gotten to a third year as the offensive play caller. Uh, so I think that's good. And your offensive line and defensive line coach and strength coach. Uh, th those are really, really important hires outside of the coordinator. So, so holding on to them. But George McDonald is a loss. Charlie Bowen only here for one year. That lack of continuity at a position is, is not great. Um, it is a especially recruiting, especially yes. recruiting because he was sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Jeremy, but, but recruiting wise, like he didn't land the big fish. He had some good lands and he really made inroads to help Illinois be in a conversation for those. So from a, a continuity on the recruiting perspective, especially with them, that's where I feel like the, the a lot of the sting is going to be. Yeah, because guys like Gabe Kaminsky, who you had an in it with Landon Brooks, you know, some of these guys that he had been recruiting. And I, I think Charlie had the potential to be an ace recruiter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're seeing a lot of guys. If they have the chance to go to the NFL, they'd rather coach in the NFL. It's, it's a better lifestyle. They don't have to do this recruiting thing, not only of future players, but of their current players. Like you have to constantly recruit your own players. And you're just the, – the schedule is is more insane. In, in the NFL, it's just ball, man. Like you, You're just coaching ball. You have more time with your family. You're not on the road uh, nearly as much. Uh, and you're home. Like you're just home more often than you are. So uh, I, I think that makes sense. It's just, you know, losing Charlie Bullen is Brett Bielema less likely to go hire an NFL coach moving forward. But the thing, the thing is like everybody wants to get to the NFL. There's only so many of those jobs. There's only 320 of those assistant coaching jobs, right? In college, there's 3000, um, you know, at the FBS level uh, for assistant coaches. So, um, but that, that's the risk, the potential flight risk when you hire an NFL guy. Yeah, and I think it's fair to ask Brett Bielema if, if the NFL route is something that he's he's really looking into moving forward. And if he got a sense that maybe Charlie was looking to get back to the NFL, like if – because obviously you don't hire the guy thinking he's going to be here for a year. So at what point did you maybe get the sense that, hey – he kind of wants that NFL lifestyle schedule. He, he and his wife just had their fourth child. Congratulations to them. I, I think you start looking at just the, the family element of it, but yeah, I mean, it's a sitting head coach just jumped to be a, the Packers defensive coordinator. Right. And now I, seems to be doing all he can to get a coordinator. Yeah, now that. the Boston college situation, what was his job security long-term? I don't know, but Chip. clearly you're clearly you're seeing, an eagerness from some coaches to make that leap. So Jim yeah, Leonard definitely really want to be an NFL coach, according to Brett Bielma. Yeah. So I, I get it. Right. But you're right. There's a finite number of those and that's, there's going to be guys who just don't, aren't, aren't able to make that jump. Obviously Charlie was one of those guys who could, because he was pretty darn good at it in the NFL. Yeah. So from what I was told, this uh, came together pretty quickly with him in the New York giants is where he's going. I haven't mentioned that. Um, pretty good gig for him. We'll see you know, Dayball. What's his job security there? But I just think, man, people want to be in the NFL and I think Charlie after a year, again, we haven't talked to him, but it's clear the NFL was too good to, for him to pass up on. Uh, but it's gonna be interesting to see where Brett Bielema goes, because I, I do think this process probably just starting because if this did come together quickly, um, and Charlie Bowen was with Brett Bielema on the recruiting trail late last week. And so I believe that, uh, I, I think this process is probably just underway that, doesn't mean he can't hire somebody Monday or Tuesday or something like that. But I, I didn't get the the vibe that this one will be within the next day. That outside linebackers coach will be hired, but it'll be interesting to see where he goes. I haven't really had the time yet to dive into potential, you know, guys who could have the connections to Brett Bioma because Charlie Bowen didn't, right? Charlie Bowen was just kind of a Palatine native, made sense he wanted to come home, was a free agent after Arizona Cardinals staff was let go. Uh, and Brett has tentacles everywhere. Yeah, I think the, a couple of things, if you're hoping for a quick hire, and I, I'm with you, I don't know that I would set that expectation. Brett Bielema had a list of guys a year ago. You would have to assume there's some overlap of availability for, from sure. that list to what he's looking at now. Great point. And he's a guy who always has a list, right? So so you combine those two things, maybe this 
this is a little bit of a quicker, I don't want to set that expectation, but I think maybe you, you can look at it like that as a possibility, especially with spring ball increasingly closer. Because you might have had a guy, a couple guys you interviewed last year who still want that job, right? Who, who still might be able to be gettable. So and there's a title there. There's a title available, right? And, and I do I do want to point out before we get too much further, unless it changes, I didn't see a an associate or assistant head coach title with Justin Stepp. I know we'll get into that. So there's still some titles sitting out there, which as we've talked about before, th- there's a financial implication to those. So I think you know, Charlie had one. I think you could look at that as something that could be an attractive element for candidates looking at that outside linebacker job. Before we get into step in McDaniel, you know, turnover is, is not ideal. There are challenges to when you have assistant coach turnover turnover. Now, Brett Bielma obviously thinks he can upgrade the two guys that he fired. And Antonio Finellis, he goes from Finellis, a guy who had no, you know, power for or assistant coaching experience or division one assistant coaching experience to a guy in David Gibbs who has nine years in the NFL and almost 30 years uh, at the FBS level, including defensive coordinator experience at the FBS or at the power five level. So that makes, makes sense for what they're looking for in Aaron to, to some, to put around Aaron Henry, but Andy Buda, Archie McDaniel going more of a younger guy. So you kind of traded off there, but a guy with more experience than Finellis. Uh, but I, I'm just interested to see where he goes with these, you know, the remaining hire he has here. But Justin Stepp, you know, you lose George McDonald, who did a phenomenal job here, right? You, you lose George, who completely revamped that wide receiver room to turn it from what was maybe the worst wide receiver room in the Big Ten to one of the best. Last year, Illinois had one of the best wide receiver cores in the Big Ten. That wasn't a deep one, um, but Isaiah Williams was one of the top two wide receivers in the Big Ten last year. Casey Washington had a phenomenal end of the season. Pat Bryant, you'd like to see more consistency still, but you, he took over games at times. And Ashton Hollins developed. He's had a guys like Malik Elzey, uh, Kanari Wilcher, Hank Beatty, guys that were high on for the future, Colin Dixon. Uh, so he did a great job. So to lose him, a kid guy who is from Illinois, uh, to lose him to Ole Miss certainly stings. But I get it from George's perspective, going for an offensive coach. Um, maybe there's more upward mobility there because Barry Lunny is going to be the play caller for Illinois for the foreseeable future. But to hire Justin Stepp, who's been in the SEC for the last six years, has developed a long string of NFL draft prospects, including highly drafted guys in Cortland Sutton, who is the 40th overall pick Traylon Burks, who was a first round draft pick of the, of the Titans. Xavier Leggett's going to be a top two round draft pick here coming up. Uh, and a guy who's recruited extremely well in the South. Um, I thought this was a pretty good response to losing George McDonald, including a guy uh, who's got some ties to Barry Lonnie coached with him for two years at Arkansas. And I want to dive into that a little bit more, but I thought this was, if, if we're grading hires, Joey, B plus would be the lowest I'd go. This is a really, really good hire from my my vantage point. Yeah, it is. His ability to develop should be attractive to the wide receivers returning on Illinois. And you, you can look, like you just named off the names. Those are guys that are recent and recognizable to, to wide receivers. So that, that's a big yeah, deal. And, and, and to point that out, like let's let's be honest. Like these wide receivers lost George McDonald. They loved him. They loved him. And and if you want to you had to make a hire that that those guys are going to believe in so they want to stick around, right? So if I'm Pat Bryan or Malik Elzey or some of these young guys coming in, I see this guy and I'm like, oh, that guy's got like seven NFL draft picks. Over I him. need to see production. I yeah. need to see proven production. And I think they get that. These guys are yeah. Portland Sutton and Traylon Burks and yeah. you know, these guys that get drafted. So that's, that's I think, huge for Brett Bielman here. Yeah, I couldn't really sleep last night. I got home and rode and – was kind of scrolling through Twitter and that must've been the Justin step finally checks Twitter hour because he was retweeting a lot of the messages and, and NFL guys are like, Hey, Illinois got a great one. This, this is a really good hire. He cares about people. I have to imagine those are being funneled out to the wide receiver room at Illinois right now. Now, like I think, yeah, I'm with you. Like this is a really, really good hire. It takes a lot of the bite out of losing George McDonald. Cause that is a significant loss. Like just because you got a really good hire, and we believe Justin Stepp is that, doesn't make losing McDonald a nothing burger. Yeah. Like there's a middle ground. Now it takes a lot out. And I think you're going to see a spring where Justin Stepp can build those relationships, show that development, help these guys improve. And like, that's a big deal as, as you go into, I mean, the, the, the spring portal, right? The spring portal window into fall camp, into the summer. 
Now he, he's going to have to find new recruiting territories and, and adapt to, you know, he's going to have an in-state territory and he's, he's recruited in the SEC. So I don't think he's going to go in there and not be able to build relationships. As you scroll through, you, you see that he's, he's good at being able to do that. And I think, and we'll get into it with Archie McDaniel, the linebacker hire. And, but this follows what Brett Bielema said on Wednesday and a desire to get more into Texas, into that Dallas area, Justin Stepp has some of those relationships down in that area. So I think that that's going to be an expanded territory for Illinois. Will New Jersey still be? I don't know. I mean, I mean, that's been an area that's been good to Illinois. I don't think they're going to abandon it, but clearly Dallas is somewhere in the Texas area, somewhere they see as, as a, maybe a, an area to make inroads. Yeah. You keep Art Dart on staff, Art Sikowski, you got those Jersey connections. And I think Bart Miller has recruited that area a little bit more mm-hmm. here uh, recently, but yeah, Stepp, you know, 2019 class, he got Tra- Traylon Burks and uh, four-star tight end Trey Knox. Rivals had him as a top 25 recruiter. 24-7 Sports ranked him as a number 23 recruiter in the SEC in the class of 2021. Top 50 SEC recruiter in 2019 and 2023. I know top 50 might not sound big, but in the SEC with – how many assistants would we have? 140. Uh, that tells you he's at least an above average recruiter. He's recruited Arkansas, South Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida. A lot of Southern connections there. Uh, began his coaching career in the college level with Dabo Sweeney uh, at Clemson, 2009 to 11. Went to Appalachian State for a couple of years. SMU for 2015 to 17, where Cortland Sutton became a star. Uh, then he spent two years with Barry Lunny at Arkansas under Chad Morris. Um, that's where, you know, he came up with SMU and, uh, was a wide receivers coach there. So that, that's the other angle I want to get into here is Barry Lunny. He had more say in this hire. That, that, that's what I'm wondering. Cause Barry inherited a staff, right? And there really hasn't, I don't know how many, how much of his fingerprints were on the Robbie Disher hire that felt like a Bielema hire given his Willie Fritz connection. Uh, then you have, you know, Bad. Ad Ward was connected to the staff here, recruiting staff, being able him a little bit. This feels like directly with Barry Lunny. And I noticed, Joey, Barry Lunny had a statement in, in the press release. That is rare that a coordinator has a statement in the press release. I love it. I love it. If he had more of a say in this hire, I love empowering him. I don't think Bielman needed to be convinced that Justin Stepp was, would be a good hire. But I do think it says something about Barry Lunny. I mean, they, this offense is taking a step forward with him. Maybe not as much and as consistent as some people want, but he had a pretty good end of the season last year. And I like that he's getting a guy that he is very comfortable with and, and the resume backs it up. Absolutely. You want him to feel like he has full control over this offense and to be able to give him, not that I, and I want to be clear, like I don't think you and I get the sense that he felt otherwise at, at any point, but to give him that power to, to you and I believe have such a heavy voice in, in this wide receiver hire. Obviously, Brett Bielema knows everybody. He's going to tell us some story about how he met Justin Stepp in 2003 somewhere and, and how they, you know, that, that's just what Brett Bielema does. And a lot of it, I'm not saying he's wrong, but like he, he's got to tie to everybody in some By way. The way but, I, am, I am partial to liking Justin Stepp just because of his haircut. So. Haircut. Is that what you call yours? Haircut? It's a haircut. It's a, it's a choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I think that's a big. De- I don't even know if it's decision, a big step to to give Barry Lunny that. It took that us kind of, there. It took us a while to use that. I, I didn't even mean to. Um, to, to give Barry Lunny that that power, that trust, like th- that's a big olive branch of trust you're extending to to your offensive coordinator to let him go out and make that hire. Assuming that's what happened, and I think it's pretty fair to assume that. So yeah. I, it says a lot about Barry too, that Justin Stepp would want to come back and work yes. with him. Like that, that is a big deal. Justin Stepp was in the SEC. Now he was a wide receiver coach. They got moved to tight ends coach. Go look at James, James Cooley. That's the name of Coley. Yeah. Coley. Go look at him. Like if you get a chance to add him, you're going to, like, I don't fault South Carolina for adding him. He is a very good assistant coach. He recruited well. So, but yeah, I mean, for Justin Stepp to leave the SEC, a South Carolina native to leave, South Carolina to come work with Barry Lunny, like that is a telling move for him to, to want to go make. Yeah, and, and he's got a big job. Justin Sepp's got a, a big job here uh, because the offense we think can be good. You know, you get Luke Altmaier back, and I think you and I both believe he's a really good playmaker that could take big steps in year two uh, as a starter. He's certainly got to prove some more things, but he's good enough to win and be a bowl caliber offense. 
We think Caden Fagan could be a star. There's some intriguing running backs behind him with Khalil Valentine coming in, Aiden Lawfrey. We still think Jordan Anderson and Josh McCray can contribute here. Uh, that's a pretty good group. You add Cole Russ to that tight end group. You think Henry Boyer can ascend. I think they've done a really good job uh, patching holes in the offensive line to where they can be pretty good up there and definitely deeper than they were last year. Like I think despite losing two guys who could be drafted, I think the offensive line could take a step forward just if they're deeper, right? Um, because so they can handle an injury. And I, I think JC Davis and Kevin Wigginson were phenomenal additions for this group. Um, but then wide receiver, you got huge question marks. There's talent there. Like Pat Bryant could be a number one Big Ten wide receiver. We I think Malik Elsey can be great. I, I really do. Ashton Hollins, though, what a what a performance he had was it Indiana. He had three catches on one drive to help lead him to a touchdown, I believe it was. You saw flashes out of him that really intrigued me. But getting a lot out of that slot group that has questions is, is going to be important. So George McDonald left a good room. Justin Stepp's got to develop it now. Um, he's got to get the most out of that talent. His resume says that he's been able to do that before. So uh, I'm encouraged. I, I'm, I'm bullish on this hire, but he does have a big job this upcoming season. Yeah, I'm 100% with you. While we're here, like – I know we'll get to questions later, but I think Adam Wakefield's question now is, is a partner one to get to while we're talking wide receivers. Is what are the expectations for the wide receiver group in spring ball? I don't like. Well, we don't see spring ball, so. Right. No, no, no. And that, I wasn't going to take that uh, jab, but I would love to see spring ball. Um, I'd love to see I, I think when, spring ball, yeah. I think when we talk about like expectations for that group, figure out who you are. Like, that's what my expectation is. Figure out who can step up and contribute with losing Casey Washington and Isaiah Williams and, and feel out Justin Stepp. Let these wide receivers – like, so like I don't have, like, a they need to develop X number of – like, I just think you got to figure out who's ready. Figure out who's ready and figure out who he can get the most out of and put them in a position to yeah. take that step because there's steps to be t- taken. Pat Bryant, during the last two years, has had 1,000 receiving yards combined. I think he's capable of 700 plus yard season, uh, maybe even more than that. I think he, if I had to bet right now, if we did our all Big Ten draft, Pat Bryant would rank very high on my list uh, of guys because I think he's going to get targeted a lot. Um, I think he's going to be able to work through maybe some mistakes. I mean, he played a bunch of reps anyway, and he's a really good blocker. Um, so I think Pat Bryant is ready to be a potential star in the Big Ten. Seven touchdowns last year led the team. Um, and I, I just think he's going to get targeted more with Casey Washington not there. He's going to be the guy that Luke Altmaier trusts the most. Would he be your number one pick in the All-Big Ten draft? Going through, going through. Seth Coleman probably won. Yeah, that's fair. Would Gay Backus be above him? Would Rosiak where, where is Gay Backus playing? <laughs> what position is he playing? But Pat would be top three for me, right? If you told me Fagan is healthy for 12 games, he'd be very high on that list. Uh, Holtmeyer, with all the questions in the Big Ten, would be somewhere on that list, high. But Pat Bryant, yes, I think he's one of your best players. And so I think that's really good. You, I think you can count on him to be really good as long as he's healthy. I think Blake Elsey can have a Pat Bryant-like sophomore year. Pat Bryant, sophomore, after having six catches, 98 yards, showing some flashes um, as a blocker especially. He had 34 catches for 453 yards and two touchdowns. Like that feels like a decent expectation level from Malik Elsey. I think Ashton Hollins can do something similar. I have more questions, to be honest with you, with the slot receivers. Like, how does Mario Sanders look in the Big Ten? Uh, does Hank Beatty take a step? Like, he's had a fumble issues that have concerned all security issues. And then after the catch issues, like among the slots, I think Canary Wilcher has probably as much potential as anybody. We just didn't see him get a lot of targets in action there. So there's some exciting talent, um, but I'm probably higher on what Bryant, LZ, Hollins will do on the perimeter than what we know about the slot guys. Yeah, this – I don't want to put too much on the spring for Malik LZ. It feels like a big one to to prove that you could be that guy and, and to for the staff to, to prove to him that they believe he's that. Like, not that I think – I think they do. I, I, I know, I know, I know. And I'm not trying to say like they – I think Casey Washington was just too dang good. That's right. And I'm not trying to say they they presented anything to the contrary last season. But you get a new coach and like there's a trust. There's, there's a two-way trust there that needs to be built. And I think for him and Ashton Hollins to prove they can step into that role, that that's big. But, yeah, the slot, 
it's hard to be a slot receiver right now because you're following Isaiah Williams, who was really, really freaking good. It's probably going to be drafted, we think. Uh, you got a combine invite. So, like, yeah, and then I just have questions behind. There's a lot of guys, but we have options. Seen a lot of, yeah, but we haven't seen a lot of production, returning production. Yeah, that's the good thing is they have a lot of options, just not a lot of proven guys outside of Pat Bryan and to some extent Ashton Hollins, right? So that, that's going to be the interesting part. Tyshawn Griffin coming back from an ACL surgery. I, I'm not expecting him to make a big impact next year, though I'm high on his future. You know, Colin Dixon, does he take a step forward? Um, we'll he's to- interesting to me, too, because yeah. he's, he's got some versatility. He's a, kind of a, a thicker body. Um, he, he's somebody who's really intriguing. I thought that was a nice a nice gift for George McDonald when they got him after the coaching change at Wisconsin. Agreed. All right, let's move on to Archie McDaniel. Matt Zenitz of 24-7 Sports yesterday reports that this is the expected hire. I can say I also expect this to be the hire, but it is not official yet from Illinois. So who is Archie McDaniel? He spent the last three seasons as a linebackers coach at Houston, a power four program. He also served as defensive assistant at Texas State, New Mexico, SMU, Tulsa, Texas Southern. That's a lot of Texas outside of the New Mexico stint there uh, for McDaniel. He played linebacker at Texas A&M, was a three-year starter for the Aggies, a team captain for the Aggies. I've listened to like a snippet of an interview, really impressive guy. Um, also, I-, I thought one interesting thing here is he serves as the president of the Minority Coaches Advancement Association, an organiza- organization founded in 2020, holds immense meetings to help train and prepare minority coaches for head coaching positions in college football. So that just tells me he's respected in the industry. He's got some leadership, obviously, to him. But he's from Texas, 80 miles south of uh, Houston in Bay City. Brett Bioma said he wants to recruit more of the Dallas area, which Lovey Smith did to some success um, because there's a direct flight from Champaign Willard Airport to Dallas. Uh, so they're really interested in that. He recruited four star linebacker Maurice Williams out of Texas in the 2023 class. So intriguing here. Um, I, I can't tell you, like Andy Boo was a well liked guy, he recruited well, had so much experience. I can't really tell you as a non football guy that didn't know exactly what goes into each of these guys, but it feels like Brett Bioma wanted more experience in his secondary room, gets David Gibbs to fill that role. It feels like he wants somebody to recruit Texas. So I don't know the exact dynamic of Boo and game day. He was in the press box, eye in the sky for Aaron Henry. Did that not work? I don't know because Brett Bielma did not really go into detail of all that stuff. But I think McDaniel is a very qualified candidate that brings recruiting ties elsewhere. Justin Steps more of the resume guy that really pops off a page, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I have – how many takes about Archie McDaniel? I'd like to talk with him, and that will happen when, once this becomes official and he meets with us. Like, I know people want to know, you know, well, you fire Andy Boo. Is this an upgrade? I don't I don't know, right? Like, here's the thing with assistant coaches, by and large. Outside of the school that you follow and, like, the really, really big hot names that you hear, how much do a lot of people know about assistant coaches in, in, in college? Like, I don't know. I mean – He's a guy, like, I'm assuming Brett Bielma had a lot of options at this position. It's a power two linebacker position where, where you can go get some guys. And he went with Archie McDaniel, who, yes, he was at Houston. He was not retained by Willie Fritz, the staff. Willie Fritz brought someone with him from Tulane for that job, which, which you see a lot. It's, it's not that's some glaring red flag to me. Right. I mean, that, that's pretty commonplace. But I don't, I don't have a big sweeping take. I mean, it's. He's, qual- he's he's definitely qualified. This is this is yeah not, oh yeah yeah. yeah. It does not feel like a reach to me. Like I I, I feel like I've seen some people kind of not impressed it's by because, it. it's fine if you it's don't because understand. Boo kind of when he got fired. Sorry, Jeremy, but like when when, when Andy Boo and we've talked about this in, in our group chats. Like when he got fired and Andy Boo, I think is a very good coach. I, I I'm at no point in time would I ever say he's not. I think he did a good job recruiting. You look at guys he got. JoJo Hayden, uh, we haven't seen much of Malachi Hood, Sabor. James Cruz, Sabor Kareem. He helped develop Dylan Rosiak. Like, I would not there, – there's no point in time that I would ever take anything away from what Andy Boo did in Champaign. I thought he did a really good job. And he was, and I, thought he was I think he was a big part of Ryan Walters building the defense here. So. I agree. And you can tell they have a relationship because Andy Boo right now is an analyst at Purdue. Or, yeah, an analyst, correct? Yep. But I think 
once that happened, he kind of moved into this like legend status of everyone like, oh it's my gosh, known I, versus the unknown. It, it, yeah, it's you, you, you knew what yeah. Andy Boo was. We don't know what Archie McDaniel is, but I think Brett obviously wants to get in Texas, and for whatever reason, I think, well, and we'll get into David Gibbs here. Andy Boo was kind of the veteran coach, was the former coordinator, and whether it didn't work with Aaron or it just didn't work in general, I think Brett thinks it's more important to get David Gibbs as that kind of presence and that that might be the upgrade over Andy Boo and Finellis and that Archie is a good linebackers coach and can get you recruiting into Texas. I, I think it's more about he thought David Gibbs could be the best right-hand man for Aaron Henry compared to Andy Boo. That's my outside view that is no inside information. Yeah, I'm with you. And he said as much when – Probably feels like a good transition to go into David Gibbs. We, we talked with him on Wednesday, and Brett Bielema said he wanted an older voice in that room. He thought going with Antonio Finellis, a teammate of Aaron Henry, someone who stood in Aaron Henry's wedding, two guys who were very, very close, was going to work out. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He thought it was going to work out better than it did, and it didn't work out. The defensive backs weren't good at all. They didn't get better. They got worse over the course of the season. The injuries played a role in that. Which you look back on it. I mean, it was a bold bet for Brett to go with Aaron Henry, and we've had this discussion before, but I can see why. Aaron is a – if you if anybody sits and talks with Aaron, he's a special dude. Like, he, he is. He's a great leader. He's inspirational. But he's still a younger coach. He's never called plays before. Brett put in charge of the DB's room. Now that Aaron is very active in that DB's room, but Aaron has to scheme and play call and all of these things, he put in charge a guy who's never been an assistant coach at this level before. So that was a bold move to do that. Um, And kudos to him for moving on from it from one year, but it did hurt them. It it clearly hurt them because those DBs, they did not play at their level. They had injuries that that obviously hurt them. They lost NFL talent. We knew they were going to regress, but they regressed far too much. Like they just did not look like a well-coached group last year. No. And I mean, yeah, Brett Brett Bielema, Told us after the season he didn't expect coaching changes. He made coaching changes. I said, what's up? What's up with that? And basically, I wanted him to, to tell us that uh, – I wanted him to tell us that, like, he knew this was going to happen. And so he did, he, during he, the season, he knew this was going to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what all went into that, but obviously the defensive backs didn't play very well. And you bring in David Gibbs. This dude is matter-of-fact. He is very matter of fact. Let's get in the press conference. I didn't cut up any clips here, but people can watch it. I was going to say, just pull it up. And you know, why'd you come to Illinois? As our friend Trevor said, peers into your soul. Like, <laughs> Wait, yeah, what, was, what was your initial impression of David Gibbs? Because there's a lot of personality there, man. My initial impression, and we, we have to say, I don't believe, and I'm sure you don't, and I know you don't, I don't know that a podium, us 20 feet away, was the best setting to initially meet him i understand how it worked into the schedule on signing day that felt like it should have been more of a scrum we call media scrum where we all kind of stand around him and it feels less formal um but i it took me a minute it took me a minute to read like what is this guy all about and and he's just dude he's matter of fact he eventually really he said a lot and i thought he was really honest and he's He's not afraid not afraid to give a little jab though uh, which i i kind of the longer I'm in this business, the less personal I take some of these things. Oh, like yeah. if Brett Bielma gives a jab at the media or, or um, Brad Underwood does. Because if you do your job well, those guys will respect you. And, but they, we got to get we got to give criticism sometimes. So I'm willing to take a little criticism. But uh, what was his what was his jab about reporters? Oh, He's I'm, like, oh, I'm sure you guys will say I'm, they all suck or something. I know I'm. I know enough about this defense to be dangerous, just like a reporter. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, I'm sure you guys will say we sucked last year and it's my job to fix it. Well, I better go fix it then, <laughs> which I thought was great. Cause it's like, yes, that is exactly what people are saying. By the I mean, end of the presser, I felt like the early part, I'm like, what, what is going on here? But he, he I, it really did turn into, he's dude. He likes football. He is a football. I hate saying football guy, but he is. And he's, Straight shooter, man. Matter of fact, like by about halfway through, I'm like, oh, he's just gonna tell it like it is. Like he's just gonna be self-deprecating about his like height that. coming in because he's he's a yeah. Guy. yeah. And you can tell he's a little that Robbie player. Disher, a little Robbie Disher with a little more bite. He reminds me a little bit of Barry Lonnie. Barry, yeah. Barry's got a really dry wit that sometimes 
I don't think people understand like, but he is self-deprecating. I, I find that to be the Southern kind of guy. Um, those guys do that a little bit more and that's kind of how they show their affection a little bit, but I, I dug it, man. Like I, I think they need some personality. I think they need a guy who's going to control that room. I think he will. And what I am most intrigued about, and, and I do think he gave us a lot of insight into him. I love that he's got connections to Ryan Walters. I know Ryan Walters has become kind of a not well-liked guy around here. He's a phenomenal defensive coach. He was a phenomenal defensive play caller. David Gibbs was the defensive backs coach at Missouri when Ryan Walters was a defense coordinator at Missouri. They started this defense together there. And then um, David Gibbs goes to, what was it, um, UCF. And Travaris Williams, I believe that's his name, was the defense coordinator, young guy. And he does well there for two years, gets hired as the Arkansas defensive coordinator. Feels like a pretty good resume for Aaron Henry's second year. Maybe would have been a good one for the first year. Um, but David Gibbs, I think, is a great resource for Aaron Henry. And we asked him about that. And I thought he gave great responses. Of like, hey, if he asked me, what I think, I'm going to tell him what he thinks. So if, he, if he's going to ask me what I think, he better not be uh, scared about the answer. Uh, but he said, hey, I got experience. These young guys are really smart. He said he said great things about Aaron and, and the way he knows the game. But he said, I've been through some of these things, so I can give them two options of what they can go with and give them you know, what is the potential better option. But I also think he can just control that defensive backs room, and Aaron can trust him to coach those guys up. I imagine, we don't know this yet, should have asked. Should have asked, yeah. Should have asked. There's only so much time and so many questions that you and I can ask, but I would imagine Aaron Henry goes back to cornerbacks and David Gibbs takes over the safeties, which uh, I think is a good thing because I think Aaron Henry's a heck of a cornerbacks coach. So uh, I love this hire. Uh, and after talking with him and learn, going through his personality a little bit, getting adjusted to that, I was really impressed by, by what he had to say, and I think it's a really good fit and pick by Brett Bielman. Yeah, I left pretty impressed with him as well. Again, a little early feeling it out, but once once and that's that's just a hard environment to meet people. But yeah, he what what I was really taken aback by was he knows he, he comes in as kind of I don't want to call him a sage or you know whatever, but a, a guy who, who's seen some things, been in this business for a long time. But I also thought he talked about I haven't transcribed it yet, I apologize. Like the balance of not coming in and being overbearing and being a voice louder than Aaron Henry. Yeah. Let he me said, get hey, that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, keep talking. I'll get it here. Yeah, He said, Hey, that's my boss. Like, and I said, well, what's the balance of, of kind of knowing how strong to come in vocally and kind of feeling that out. And I thought he answered everything really let me well. And then he got the quote. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do whatever he wants me to do, whatever he tells me to do. He's my boss. I'm not going to be that guy that comes here to be in charge. I came here to help and help build this program and get it back to where it should be. But if you ask me, I'm one of those guys who's done it for so long that if you ask me, I'm going to tell you. If you don't want to know what I think, then don't ask me. But again, I think that's a good thing because there's all sorts of things that I've been through. If he ever does have a question of what he should do, I'm going to give him a couple options. and He'll be very educated and experienced. Here's what I said about uh, Aaron a little bit. These young cats, the truth is they're so much smarter than I am. They see the game totally different than I do. Of course, Coach B sees it better than anybody, but it's exciting because they want to learn. Anyone, Aaron's no different than Ryan when I first got around him. They want any help they can get because you've seen it. You've been there. You've done that. But at the same time, it's got to be the right match. You can't be the old guy in the room who's in the room trying to cause problems and not be on the same page. I'm excited. Coach Henry is as smart as any coaches I've been around. I'm fired up for it. Clearly, we got some things we need to fix, which, knock on wood, I don't think will be a problem. We'll see what happens. So two things. Very Andy Boo-like with, with when Ryan took over as defensive coordinator. Very experienced guy who, who knew the value of his voice and knew not to overstep. I get very similar vibes in terms of that dynamic with, with Aaron Henry now and, and David Gibbs and two he acknowledged like you and I like it when coaches say stuff and when players say stuff like it, it makes our job easy because you get insight into, into what's going on and I'm glad he didn't come up there and say what are you guys talking about yeah it's a talented room yeah we'll, we'll be great like he acknowledged hey they struggled and he said at one point there were guys on the field who didn't need to be on the field last year. Right. I assume that was a reference to the injuries, which is very fair to say. And there was a young defensive back room. But he didn't come in and sugarcoat. Like, I, I thought that was a good tone to set. Like, yeah, we got to be better here. 
th- this has got to be a position group that get we get more out of. And I thought that was a really, really encouraging thing. And and he you know said he didn't get a chance to dive in entirely, but he knew enough to to know kind of what was coming back and what some of the issues were. I just think it's a good balance, a good resource for Aaron to have a guy who's sat in this literally this exact same chair before in his career. Like that is so valuable just from a, a perspective of knowing how to say, what to say and how to say it to get your message across in the best way. Yeah. And just to give people a resume, he was the defense coordinator at Minnesota under Glenn Mason from 97 to 2000. They made a lot of bowl games, uh, Auburn for one year in 2005, spent nine years in the NFL after that Houston, the DC for two years it was a DC under Cliff Kingsbury, Texas tech for four years. And that's when he went with Ryan Walters at Missouri, UCF, and, and now at Illinois. Um, I thought it was a pretty solid hire on paper. I was more sold after meeting him. Um, I, I, I just thought, you know, you get into the Ryan Walters stuff and uh, I think that's important. Um, you know, they got to make some changes in the defense and he's been part of it. I like that. And uh, I just think his experience really compliments Aaron Henry really, really well. All right. We're getting some of these questions here coming up, but uh, Illinois did have a late sleeper edition Tanner Heckle in the class of 2024. We knew he had visited, uh, didn't know the scholarship was definitely offered, but Illinois, Adds for a third straight year, a late sleeper safety could play corner, could play nickel as well. Uh, but I think uh, he, he's that safety kind of role. Undersized, 5'11, 175. But boy, he's an athlete, 24 foot long jump, uh, which is elite, uh, even for a college athlete. Under sub 11, uh, 100 meter dash, which is really, really good as well. Uh, eight man football player of the year in Kansas, two. Eight man football players in this class: Tanner Hollinger, the tight end out of Nebraska, and now Tanner Heckle. What did you make of this addition, Joe? Find you somebody who loves you like Brett Bielema loves defensive backs under the radar defensive backs in February. Um, it makes sense, right? Like it, it is a. Should, should I, note, kind of- I want to note here: twenty four seven Sports uh, rated him eighty seven. That, that's a higher three star rate. I think that's the eighth highest rated guy in this class. And, you know, those guys don't have Illinois bias uh, at 24 seven sports. So I found that really intriguing. They, they like to see those verifiable athletic numbers and they dove into the film. So I, that that's a pretty, if you're an Illinois fan and you'd be sold on this, I, I think from an unbiased eye, like an Alan true or the national guys who are rating him, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I want to Alan true responded on Twitter. Someone asked, you know, why, why is he an 87? And Alan True said, track numbers and basketball tape spoke to the athleticism seen on his football tape. Hard to find guys who can run and are explosive. I think the national staff felt good about how he projects. He's a really good athlete. He is a really good athlete. He has played 11-man football. Uh, yeah. he, he transferred to Linden after his mom took the head basketball girls' head basketball coach job. He, this isn't some guy who's just played eight-man football his whole life and you know, you, you don't know. He, he's a really good athlete. He's probably just, gonna have to add football, just to let you know, like he was a quarterback, yeah. lit it up. 2,000 rushing yards. What do you have, 70 touchdowns? That's a year, a thousand passing yards. Um, you get more space to operate, right? So that's a good thing on offense. But on defense, I think it's a little bit more troublesome. He had 80 tackles, seven interceptions. I get it. The competition is not that high, but he's dominating it. So I, I just wanted to mention that. There's just more space in eight-man yeah. football. Yeah, it, but the athleticism jumps out. I mean, he is a, f- a freak athlete. He, he's really, really athletic. I, I talked to his coach for a coach speak. We have that on on com, And he said, you can see all the numbers, and they're impressive. But when you see it in person, it's like, oh, okay. He's like, he dunks. I don't know if he's going to come down. It's going to be an adjustment period. There always is. Like, this is the standard operating procedure for freshmen coming in. Is you're going to have to get bigger. I don't know if I mean, you're going to have to get faster and stronger, which is – good because it's pretty high floor there and, and like he's he's going to a defensive back room that's going to have guys like Mac Resetich, Matt Bailey I think uh, Sabor Kareem's probably a, a corner we'll see how all this ultimately shakes out but guys like one of those corners is going to end up at safety they just they need some more numbers and safety. it does and they didn't add in the portal to this point like they did with with Clayton Bush and Nicario Harper a year ago so I'm, I don't think you and I would set the expectation to see him come in and, and play immediately as a freshman, though these February guys do kind of have a history. Percentage in Matthew Bailey. That's, <laughs> that's why I don't want to I want to put anything out um, about it because the athleticism certainly translates. I talked with Tanner 
really impressive kid, really smart. Um, I think he knows what he's getting into here. So I, I get it. If you, if you have any reservations about, you know, this guy didn't have any other division one offers. Uh, he didn't do much in the recruiting process. I, I got a story up on him. He went to a Kansas camp, uh, thought he performed well, didn't get any bites from anybody. Kansas state was looking into him a little bit. Kansas really did not. Um, so I find that interesting, but Illinois, uh, I think they did a lot of work in him and the athleticism on paper certainly, certainly translates. So, uh, going through his stuff, I was like, you know, a guy I wasn't the highest on coming in was Kirby Joseph was kind of my first, like he got the athletic traits a little bit raw though. I, I kind of thought his athleticism translated that free safety role, but when I put on the film and dove into it a little bit more, especially the defensive film, I'm like, man, undersized safety, really physical freak athlete, which we found out in the combine. This guy was a freak athlete. I go, there's some Sydney Brown there. <laughs> and I walk into the Illinois football office for Brett Bielema's press conference. I'm just asking somebody about him, somebody on the staff. And Sydney Brown was the first comp. I didn't even bring it up, Joey. So I felt, Hey, that, that's a win. Like, cause I, I miss on a lot of those comps, but undersized safety doesn't mean he's going to be a third round draft pick here, but you can just see some of those traits and just the, the competitiveness, man. Like in, the, in this staff cares a lot about, if you had the athletic traits, you got the competitiveness, you got the intelligence, the staff will probably take a chance on you. Yeah. I'm not sure if he can catch a cold or what his hands are like, but if this whole safety thing doesn't work out that speed. We talked a lot about slot receiver, didn't we? Like that, that would seem to play. So yeah, we'll see. Right. I mean, we'll see. I, I, I did special see teamer at worst special teamer, right. At worst. Yeah. I, I did see some people on our boards talking about, you know, you replace a guy in Josiah Knight who is signed with Mississippi state. We can, we can get to that here in one second with a no power five guy like Tanner Heckle. I, that wasn't one for one. I think if Josiah Knight was here, they would still, they, they recruited Tanner Heckle when Josiah Knight was here. So it's not like that's a, and they're two different positions. So it's not a one for one deal. The Josiah Knight thing. He, he signed with Illinois. Was they, might, the they, they were looking into transfer safeties and from what I understand, like they were higher on Tanner than yeah. some of the transfer safety options. So I still think they could add somebody in that defensive backroom corner, especially, um, because if Matthew Bailey's healthy, I feel really good about him. I think they feel good about Matt Krasetic as depth. Um, but I, I do think Miles Scott could use some competition. I'm, I'm wondering who that could be. Um, so I would still like to see a transfer safety, but that's probably a scholarship number, but they felt good enough about Tanner Eckle to potentially take him over a transfer safety, or at least to any that are available right now. Yeah. And while we're talking transfers, let's also mention, and I'm not to suggest that any of these new three coaches who, who come from college football, have anyone in store they're bringing with them. But a lot of these guys, Archie McDaniel, David Gibbs, uh, Justin Stepp, have done this for a while. They've recruited a lot of guys, whether they've landed them all or they haven't. So there's a lot of branches out there. We'll see if there's any connections when that spring portal window opens that, hey, maybe so-and-so is in the portal for, and they were recruited by one of these three guys out of high school, didn't pick them, and now they want to revisit that. Like I think that's something you have to factor in when you bring guys in who have college football experience. We'll see what happens with the outside linebacker spot. I don't know if that'll be the case, but I think that's an interesting interesting element to add to it. Yeah. All right, let's get to uh, Josiah Knight here. We'll get to some of the questions coming up here. But first, I want to hear from one of our great sponsors. There's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. So wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals from Factor delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and my favorite guys, Protein Plus. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. The great part about Factor, they're two-minute meals. So you fuel up fast with Factor's restaurant-quality meals. They're ready to heat and eat wherever you are. Plus, they have snacks, smoothies, and more, so you can discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. And we've done the math. Sign up and save. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. No prep, no mess meals. 
Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat, so there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed. So head to factormeals.com slash Illini50 and use code Illini50 to get 50% off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active. That's code Illini50 at factormeals.com slash Illini50 to get 50% off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active. All right, Joey Wagner, uh, let's get into our uh, first Fedigator. Thanks for the $10 super chat. We appreciate all the super chats. And thank you to all of our live YouTube listeners, more than 100 people on a Friday morning talking some Illini football. Hit that like button if you're here with us. We appreciate all your support. Subscribe to us. Hit the notifications bell. Fedigator, which comes first, a nine-win season or actual working Wi-Fi at Memorial Stadium? Love these live streams. Yeah, we love going live whenever we can. We'll do one after the Michigan State game tomorrow as Joey and I head up to East Lansing tonight. Uh, nine one seasons tough. Nine one seasons tough. Uh, I don't know. Working Wi Fi is not tough. <laughs> like that, I, we, we don't. I'm trying to sound, see it. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not. Um, but I, I've I've heard like people have have mentioned that to be a concern. So I think that's something as they continue to to improve this game day experience that needs to be focused on because I, I don't I do understand that there's some there's some connectivity issues at, at Memorial Stadium with all those people. Yeah, it's amazing because like even if you're with fifty thousand people, you want to be able to share stuff with the rest of the world while you're doing this, whether it's Twitter or check things on Twitter or whatever it is um, that that people want to connect to. Uh, the press Wi-Fi, fantastic at Memorial Stadium, but uh, I don't want people going on our Wi-Fi because it's so good, Joey. I'll do. I'll get the you password. Too, for speed. Speed. We're so good. I'll get the password away for a super chat to cover tonight. <laughs> there you go, uh, <laughs> Josiah Knight, not a part of this class. Really weird situation. Okay. Uh, and when anything's academic related, uh, you don't want to get too into it. Josiah is a very good student. Um, but Josiah Knight was signed with Illinois. He was on campus, waved to the crowd at one of the basketball games. But there was an admissions issue that had to do with where he got some of his credits. Um, and it was not an issue at Mississippi State, so he was able to get in there. Illinois really tried hard to, to get him in here. But there was a missions issue at the university, and it's a shame because Josiah Knight's a really good player, really good kid, and Illinois really, really wanted him. And I think he's got tremendous upside. But it is true that Brett Bielema did help Josiah uh, end up somewhere else. He had Big Ten options as well. Um, I heard one of those options was Maryland, um, and he ends up at Mississippi State, which Illinois did work hard with, you know, his high school coach and everybody else. So I'll, I'll give them credit for all that, but they're certainly disappointed. Josiah Knight is not here. Cause I thought he had one of the highest upsides in this class of 2024, especially defensively. Yeah. That was not an easy goodbye for, it sounds like really anyone involved. I, that, that was a bummer. Cause he, he was a good prospect. One of the better prospects in this class. Uh, that was a tough one for Illinois. And, and he looked like a, another piece to, to a defense or an outside linebacker room that we think has some pretty good long-term upside. Yeah, and some people ask, well, how did this come up so late? From what we understand, late December is when this came up. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think admissions does interviews. I don't think um, Illinois wants to talk too much about this stuff, but um, it's a shame. It, it's a shame. All right, um, let's get to some of these questions in the chat here uh, before we get out of here, Joey. Fedegar did say these these uh, changes are very similar to what happened in Arkansas. We all know how that ended. Can't help but think that. Brett Bielma is making the same mistakes. One thing I will say, I would much rather coach move on from what he thinks is a mistake right away and be urgent than let it fester if he thinks that. Now, one thing about Illinois, like I think it's a good thing that Illinois finally has coaches that other good programs, great programs like Ole Miss or the NFL wants to hire. I've covered Illinois football for a very long time. There are far many, far way, way more Brett Bielma assistants that are getting good jobs or better jobs than the two previous regimes by far. Uh, you don't want to lose guys, but if guys are getting promoted and people are looking at your program, I think that's a good sign. You just like to keep as many as possible. So if a Michigan is looking into a Terrence Jamison, as you know, some people are reporting, like you don't want to lose him. But I'd rather my coaches be wanted than not wanted. Yeah, and that the turn, you know, as that reports out there, very Orlando Antigua esque 
uh, in terms of how I think Illinois should approach this. Illinois fought hard, if you'll remember, when Antigua was in the mix and ultimately went to Kentucky. They fought really hard, and they made a – our understanding is it was a financial commitment that they were ready to make to him. I would do a similar thing with Terrence Jameson. I know the recruiting early on in his tenure at Illinois in the class of 2022 left some to be desired. Yeah. He is really, really darn good at this. He, he's really good. And, and the recruiting has picked up. He, he's one of the, you know, I, I think one of the probably the better defensive line coaches you're going to find. He, he's, and, and we, we could talk about Johnny Newton development, Keith Randolph development. Denzel Daxon. It's Denzel Daxon to me. And Calvin Avery. Those, yes. those two guys are some of the best stories of Terrence Jameson's development. Like, I think that's as big of a sell uh, as any of them. And that's why I'm really intrigued this year. What can he do with Anthony Johnson? What can he do with an etchy sledge? Like, what can he do? Anichi, I got to keep getting that in my head. Anichi sledge. What can he do with some of these younger Alex Bray, um, T. Ra Edwards? I I'm really intrigued to see what he can do because I do think he's one of the better tactician defensive line coaches. And I thought he had a hell of a recruiting year. I think he had a heck of a recruiting year. Um, you know, Demetrius John, Andrew McComb, I think are good power forward gets. Um, you know, Joe Barna is probably going to be a part of that group. Eddie Turk is a part of that group. And then what he did in the transfer portal, I think was really good. Dennis Briggs, uh, we'll see what he can add, but he's certainly a talented player from Florida State, seventh year guy. I thought it was a really good recruiting cycle for Terrence Jamison. So, yeah, our 24 7 sports said Terrence Jamison is one of the guys Michigan might be looking into. His brother played at Michigan. Listen, I, Sharon Moore, I don't know a connection there with Terrence Jamison. He certainly is connected to, to Brett Bielma, and Brett Bielma has given him titles, given him raises. Um, so I, I question whether he would leave Brett Bielma, uh, even though it is Michigan, but you know, he's a guy you want to keep. Like him, Bart Miller, Tank Wright, th those guys are, you really want to keep those guys. Yeah, he's really good. I'm, I know you, you mentioned it on the board the other day, but he's starting to get his flowers for, for probably a little bit overdue. He, he's very, very good, and it was a good hire. It's my understanding. I don't believe Purdue was very eager to lose him when Brett Bielema hired him away from them prior to the 2021 season, and you're seeing why, man. He's good. And I think those guards are, are a position that he can develop really well, and obviously, as you mentioned, Johnny Newton and Keith Randolph, but that nose guard position he does a good job with. Taylor, Brett mentioned the remaining spot needing to wait until after this weekend. Anyone from the Chiefs or 49ers come to mind? I don't think any current assistant coaches – I mean, Brett says a lot of things in a press conference. He said the yeah, linebackers yeah. coach he was waiting to, to, to interview somebody else. Um, that is not official yet with Archie McDaniel, but I think that's just a matter of time. Um, I mean, there is some people – was it Webster? From the yeah, yeah, we looked. We looked through the staffs and, and – I know this is an SHG native. I'm drawing a blank. Forgive me on his name on one of the steps. He's been in the NFL for 18 years. I, I would be hard. I don't know the man. Never spoken with him. You're in the NFL for 18 years. I don't get the sense that uh, you're position you're coach to, for a Super Bowl team. I doubt you're yeah. leaving for Illinois. So I, I think maybe there was a guy that Brett Bielema was interested in talking to. Uh, that, that clearly, I, I don't think that statement has a tie to the outside linebacker position. I think those are two independent things. Yeah, Jacob Webster is a guy with some connections. He's a defensive quality coach with the 49ers. He's young. I think he's 26. But he worked at Missouri when David Gibbs was at Missouri as a defensive graduate assistant and volunteer. Uh, and he also was at Wisconsin as a graduate assistant um, under Jim Leonard. So there's some connections there. But that's a that's a young guy. Uh, I would imagine when you have Gay back as Seth Coleman, you're probably going to be going with somebody with some experience because you got to get the most out of those guys. Yeah, I, I agree. So I, I, I think Charlie Bowen the first half did not, and Aaron Henry, I would throw in there. They did not get enough out of those guys. The back half of the season, those two were great. Yeah, I, I just think that I don't know. If maybe Brad Bielma actually was looking at someone on, on one of those Super Bowl teams, but I I get the sense that that is not in play anymore. All right. Uh, Chris, George McDonald leaving to me is wild to me. Not a good sign. Oh, can we? The, uh, that, that's a follow up to an earlier comment. He said, This much roster churn concerns me, makes me wonder if they see the writing on the wall. I think we need to evaluate what the roster churn is. Like, two were decisions made by Brett Bielma. Half of them were, were made by Brett Bielma. One was to go to Ole Miss. 
where we think there's, as we've talked about, upward movement, college football playoff contender. And one was for a guy who probably realized he liked coaching in the NFL more. So, like, I don't see this as some, like, people are packing their bags and fleeing champagne. There is a lot of churn. Like, there's a lot of roster turnover this offseason as there was last. But I think if you look at it, it doesn't feel like a an exodus away from this. Rats fleeing the ship. And, and to be honest with you, Brett Bielma is not on the hot seat. No. He's, he's not. Like, he, he just is. Um, I've, I've seen some people tweet like, why can't Illinois be Missouri? Go look at Gary Pinkle's first six years. Look how long that took to get them to the point that they were competing for conference championships. And then Eli Drinkwitz takes some time to figure it all out, right? It took him a little bit of time to figure it all out, but there was something already built there because Gary Pinkle took like half of more a decade to go build that thing. You're going to have to replace assistant coaches. Assistant coach churn happens everywhere. I've seen some people in the chat talk about Iowa. They have a defensive coordinator that never wanted to leave, right? And and that's a kudos to them. You'd love to see – Barry Lenny wants to be a head coach. But you'd love to see Bart Miller and Terrence Jameson be long-term guys at Illinois. Tank Wright be a long-term guy at Illinois. If Barry Lenny – becomes a head coach, that's a good sign. Ryan Walters became a good coach. That's that's a good sign, I think, for Brett Bielma, who has a good history of developing head coaches. You would like certain core guys to, to stick around for a long, long time. And that's where I look at Bart Miller or Terrence Jameson. You'd love to keep those guys as like, they are the Brett Bielma guys the rest of the way. Do they want to be head coaches someday? Maybe. I think everybody wants at some point to, to lead their own thing. But it happens a lot of places. Now, if McDonald, Tank Wright, and Terrence Jameson all left in the same offseason, yeah, I would start to get concerned. We haven't seen that happen. So, no, and I think probably Bowling going back to the NFL. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go. Oh my God, what is happening there? That's just no. And boy, I completely forgot the point. But um, George, George, listen, he's this is all modern. Um, but Lane Kiffin's an offensive head coach. SEC is and Ole Miss is going to be competing for a college football playoff. I, I think he got a little bit of a raise. I, I think he just saw it as an opportunity. George wants to be a head coach. And I think there's a little bit more upward mobility at a program like Ole Miss that gets more notoriety and people look at it more. And if you're in a college football playoff or competing for an SEC title and you know maybe the offensive coordinator goes somewhere else, maybe George McDonald can be a play caller again. Because he was a, he was an offensive coordinator at NC State a decade ago, and I think he's he was probably one step away from being a head coach. I think this gets him closer to being that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think to put a bow on this, like I don't think you or I want to minimize the impact of, of four coaches. No, like replacing four coaches that is a big deal. It, it's a it's a big spring. It's a big step ahead, but it, I think it is worth providing some context around how those four coaches and those positions opened up and yes. to, to paint a more clear picture of four guys out of here. See you later. Like there's so much more depth and detail that needs to be included in that discussion. Yeah. I do not want to minimize that there is risk here. Like this, this is a, this is a critical point in the program. This is a critical point in Brett Bielema's tenure, but I'm happy he shows urgency to make moves that he feels needed to be made. And Justin step to me, pretty dang good replacement. You know, you didn't want to lose George McDonald, but when she did, I think that's a really, really good hire. Um, and we'll find out what he does to replace Charlie Bowen, which I thought I was personally just go by the current really big fan of Charlie. Mm -hmm. I just really enjoyed talking with him. He obviously knows what he's coaching. I thought it was mixed results year one, right? Like Kevin Kane did a great job with that group in 2022, had a great group behind him, had Ryan Walters as a defensive play caller. But I didn't know if that was a clear upgrade after year one. Um, so we'll see what they can do here. But Brett Bielma hires pretty good candidates from what I've seen so far. On paper, I I think Archie McDaniel, David Gibbs is probably an upgrade over what Andy Boo and Antonio Finellis were last year. And it's probably more Finellis in his experience. Uh, Step, I think, is about the same about what George McDonald is, just a little less experience, but has a really good – resume and we'll see what they would do with the outside linebackers coach but it all has to fit it all has to fit and i do think defensively david gibbs is a really good fit with aaron Henry. yeah i agree wholeheartedly i, I struggle to to see losing andy boo as an upgrade obviously we haven't talked to archie mcdaniel he's qualified i was really high on what andy boo did at illinois 
I'm not saying Archie McDaniel cannot achieve those things, but I thought Andy Boo was good. We'll see how this all, how the big puzzle, I guess, fits together there. Yeah. Um, go make a bowl game. Go make a bowl game. I think people would have felt a lot better if they were six and six rather than five and seven. Understandably so. Understandably so. They missed opportunities. Still, I look back on that season, Joey. Like, listen, the Northwestern thing was really heartbreaking. To lose a game like that, the way they lost it on special teams, basically, really heartbreaking. The Nebraska and Purdue games continue to be the ones that just can't happen. Those cannot happen. And it, our boy Trevor Valise sent us a message like, is, is adding these Pac-12 teams, is it really scarier than playing Ohio State? Or you know, So as long as you don't get like all those great programs at the same time, I think the Big Ten did a great job. You got to beat Purdue and Northwestern. You play those teams every year. Beat those teams, and you're probably going to bowl games. Because the one thing Brett Bielema has done outside of that Purdue and Nebraska game last year is they're consistently competitive, and you're going to give yourself a chance to win games or lose games in the fourth quarter. Uh, and you got to execute. You got to get the most out of your players. I think they're recruiting better than the previous staff. I think Illinois is basically what Minnesota has been under PJ Fleck, which is a vast improvement. But to elevate. You have to win more of those games. You have to win more of those close games. You have to coach these guys up, and you have to develop. And I think the development of the recruits they've brought in is really, really important to Illinois finding consistent competitiveness and what I would call relative success, which for me, over the next three, four years, you want to consistently win an average of seven, eight games a year, seven games a year, something like that. I think that would be a huge step forward for Illinois and um, obviously, you got a bad taste in your mouth going six and eleven in the last seventeen. Yeah, I, I totally I understand that, and your two wins from three straight bowl games and feeling a lot different, right? And, and I think that's where some of that that frustration or, or maybe doubt would creep in. Uh, one more, Jeremy, if we could before yeah. I I go to basketball here, Fedigator, our guy, it's consistent. I like that. Um, be nice if we could actually get the most of the. Most of the top 15 recruits in Illinois before worrying about Dallas. I just want to point out, like, I, I get it. I, and Brett Bielema has put some of this on himself by coming in and, and making it a point to recruit the state of Illinois. And you set the expectation that you're going to be in the conversation for these guys. Like, that's that's what you want. Like, you don't want to feel like top 15 guys are just not even a thought on the radar. I also think those two things can work at the same time. Like, when we talk about the recruiting schedule – you're doing a lot. So like you're not going to Dallas and saying, okay, no, thank you to Illinois. You've seen that done at Illinois before in the past. Yes. I don't think, I don't <laughs> think Brett Bielma just the way that we've observed is, is going to go that route. I just, just want to point out, like you can recruit, you can add another recruiting area without taking away the attention that you pay to the state of Illinois. And I would point this out. We can, this is where it gets hard for me even, um, you know, Tyshawn Griffin and Eddie Turk were not top 15 prospects in the class of 2024. The class of 2024 was loaded in the state. They would have been top 15 prospects the year prior. And the year prior, Malik Elzey and Caden Fagan were top five prospects. They would not have been top five prospects last year. Faden wouldn't have been in the top 10 of the class of 2024. So I just want to put that into perspective. They are still landing. And maybe it's a low bar. Maybe I need to raise my bar. But there is definite progress happening on the field in terms of competitiveness. Now you want to elevate and win more of those games and raise your bar. And Brett Beal must talked about that. And he did not come here to win five games. I agree with that. They have missed opportunities. But they're also recruiting better prospects from the state. And they're in on pros better prospects across the state. Landing the top 247 guys can be very hard. NIL is a big deal for a lot of those guys. And to be honest with you, I would rather invest in transfers if I'm going to do the NIL game, then a prep prospect who I don't know if he's going to be around for a while and probably not going to make an impact in year one. Um, but they are getting that next group of guys. They're getting a fair share of those. You'd like to beat Iowa and Wisconsin a little bit more often than you are right now, but those programs have been far better than you. Um, so the guys that I'm looking at in this class, like I think adding Michael McDonough was a litmus test recruit. Uh, I think Braden Trimble and Andre Lavette are litmus test recruits. No, they do not have a four star in front of their name, but they have loaded Big Ten offer lists. Uh, and I, this is where I think it's difficult because I thought you were gaining some traction. Gabe Kaminsky, for me, would have been a big one. But they are in on Nathaniel Marshall. They are in in Yose Epinesa. Like they are in the mix. Whether they can land those guys, I don't know, but they are in the top four or five. 
for those prospects. But when Miami's coming in here with helicopters and throwing around NIL and Epinesa's got the Iowa legacy, it's going to be still hard for Illinois to win those battles this early in the tenure before you are able to stack winning seasons. But the, the sell is resonating more. I don't know if that means a lot to Illini fans until you land them, but it's it's such it's such an improvement from what I've covered before uh, that maybe it's not showing itself enough in four star prospects, but they're still they're still landing way better players in the state. Yeah, I think to zoom out on what you said, I think the bar in terms of what fans expect reasonably expect out of this program, both on the field and recruiting, has been raised. Now yeah. you're kind of the the keep elevating phase. Yep. You've been in enough close games, elevate to more wins, elevate to seven or eight wins. You've been in enough close recruiting battles. The expectation that you're going to try for these top 15, 20 prospects in the state is there. Now go win them. Go get those guys. Like, I think Can that's I what you're though, saying. Like, like, this year could be that year where the in-state winning starts to show. Like, Wink Elsie and Caden Fagan are huge parts of this offense this year. Huge yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and and kids see that you you want to be, you know, see that opportunity exist. I, I just think that credit to this coaching staff for for raising and making people feel like these these goals, these top 15s, these seven eight wins, is something that's capable of happening here. Now it's it's elevate and go do it, go do it consistently. Uh, they, they have had those wins. They've had those winning seasons. The one winning season, you, you've seen them win big recruiting battles with Caden Fagan, Malik Elzey. Now it's just do it more, elevate it more. And, and it, it's whether people realize it or not, the fact that you want that and, and feel like it's a reasonable thing, that's where the step up in this program has come. Aiden Lofter, you going to be a big part of this offense. Hank Beatty could be a big part of this offense. Henry Boyer could be a big part of this offense. I'm just going through like Josh Crutes. I know they didn't recruit him. The previous staff did. Um, on defense, Matthew Bailey, James Crutes, I think are going to be Henderson. Brandon Henderson on offense. I just, that, that's what I mean. I, I think you're going to start seeing some of those play out this year, um, which I think is interesting. All right, Joey's got to get to basketball media availability. We'll let you go. Joey, thank you very much. Fun, man. See you in a few hours and uh, be in East Lansing. Appreciate it. Find, find a good dinner. Find a good dinner place, Warner. That's your goal. All right. I'll figure it out. Thank you to everybody for listening to the Alana Choir podcast. Thanks to our Harder Plus live YouTube listeners. Hit the like button on your way out. Subscribe to us. Hit the notifications bell. Everybody have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time right here on the Alana Choir podcast.